Welcome back to Sip the Talent Films. I'm your host, Coach Evans, and today we're going to give a little recap or a reaction video to Eric DaCosta's press conference. Now, initially, I wanted to do Eric DaCosta and John Harbaugh's press conference, and listening to Eric DaCosta, I, you know, cool and taken aback and interested to hear what he had to say about different things as far as rebuilding the team and restacking us to try to make another Super Bowl run. But when John's time to speak came, I was listening and I was kind of sounded like Charlie Brown's teacher to me. So I won't be making any reactionary statements to what John Harbaugh had to say. I had one reactionary statement on Twitter to what he had to say, and that's all I'm going to address about what Harbaugh had to say. I just, I just tune him out right now to me. Like, no, nothing good, nothing bad. I just don't really have much to talk about when it comes to Harbs right now. So, but just speaking on what Eric DaCosta had to say, a few things he said that kind of stood out and I kind of want to touch on a little bit and we can uh, say what he said and I'll say my reaction to it and we'll go from there. Uh, he briefly talked about the Zay Flowers situation and said they're monitoring it. So if you've been living under a rock, you know that Zay potentially, supposedly, maybe had a domestic violence situation with a girlfriend or with his girlfriend or whatever they are, you know, at the moment or in the past or whatever. And the details of it have been put out in the paper. I'm not going to, you know, rehash it. You know, I know what they are from reading. I don't, I wasn't there from reading. I know what they are. Uh, if you want to know, you go and that, I'm, you know, it is what it is. But uh, they say they're monitoring the situation. They put out a statement last week. Zay's is not getting charged for anything for what I know of so far. So um, I don't know if he's in the clear. I don't know if he's gonna get suspended. Righteously, I don't really care unless he did something wrong. Now, if he did something wrong, he should be punished. If he didn't, he should, should not. But until he's been proven to do something wrong, I'm strictly with the football part of it. Now, if he did something wrong, get it. But if he didn't, it's not my business, his situation, until the police arrest him, put him in cuffs, and the judge say, hey, you did X, Y, Z. For me, the conversation is strictly football. So, you know, they say they monitoring it. They're going to do whatever they, whatever they got to do with it. I'm cool with it. So, you know, in that situation, I understand it's a business. They got to protect their brand. You know, whatever they decide to do, you won't hear me give any pushback, you know, from my point of view. You know, even if my, even if my say-so matter, which it don't. You just won't hear me push back like I do from some football takes from, from that. Let's move on to the second thing he talked about. He spoke on the fit of Nelson Aguilar for the Baltimore Ravens. So if you don't know, Nelson Aguilar, right before the void years kicked in, signed a one-year deal. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's like three and a half million or 3.75. The exact number kind of slips my mind at the moment. But I think Nelly, and I don't remember who said it, is an actual great fit. He's like a glue guy. He's, he's not your number one receiver, definitely. Maybe not even your number two. But definitely a third receiver on your team. And with him being the third receiver, he's not even your number three option, technically. He's your fourth or fifth guy. Because if you look at receivers, you look at Zay, you look at Mark, you look at Likely, maybe you look at your, your backs, you got Nelly. So he's your fourth, maybe fifth option at times, and having a guy that fits that role, that comes in and, and does his work, and when opportunities present himself, he made the most of them, and did he have some drops? Yeah, but for the most part, he was where he needed to be, made the plays he needed to make, um, made some plays that weren't necessarily for him, and took it to the crib, so, but did he have some drops? Yeah, but, you know, he's the fourth, third, fourth receiver, he's not going to be that guy. So, you know, I think what he did for the team was a professional. Well, they're all professionals, but when we say a guy's professional, he didn't come in with immaturity and, and all this other BS that some of these guys have. He came in, did his job, did his work, did his workouts, showed up for practice, and, and, and did what he needed to do to be a consummate pro. So I'm happy with Nellie resigning. I like what he gave us this year. 
uh, and hopefully he can improve on that with the second year being in the system. He was also asked about the improvement of Adafi Owe, and I mean, um, Iri DaCosta. Iri DaCosta was asked about the improvement of Adafi Owe, and he mentioned that we all get caught up in sacks, and the way he looked at it is not just about sacks. It's about pressures. It's about QB hits. And it's about a bunch of different things that go into it, go into their evaluation of a player. Now, I personally said it um, on a bunch of different platforms that Adolphe always looked like a different player this year. He looked way more athletic. He didn't look as robotic in his moves. He looked way more fluent in his moves. He looked like he developed multiple moves. He was able to put multiple moves together in plays like he would – uh, do cross chop and then maybe put a spin on it. He would go from speed to power and, and, and double that up with something else. He was able to put together combination moves in plays. Now, that didn't always guarantee that he was going to get home, but in the past, he really had one move. He would bull rush you, or he tried to beat you with speed, or he tried to spin on you. There was never multiple moves in a play. And he was always a decent edge setter, you know, to for stopping the run. So him being able to develop his game more and not look as robotic in his movements was a plus to me. And so I was happy to see his improvement. And even though it didn't result in a bunch of sacks, he still played a lot better. But he ended up, I think, hurting his foot. So he didn't play as much as I would have liked him to play this whole year. But he looked like a totally different player on the field. So I do kind of see what DaCosta was talking about as far as the improvement of Odafe Owe. All right, so the next thing he talked about or was asked about was the running back position. So if you don't know, we have pretty much two running backs on staff. We got the injured Keith Mitchell, and we got Justice Hill. Gus Elba's contract is over. J.K.'s rookie deal is over. And I know we got some UDFAs, but they non-factors. Um, so really, it's Keaton and Justice Hill. Uh, there are a lot of guys, myself included, have talked about some top free agent running backs that we'd like to see on this team. Uh, a lot of people want Derrick Henry, uh, Saquon Barkley. Uh, my, I threw Josh Jacobs out there. I threw um, Tony Pollard out there. Uh, Swift's the name that goes out there. But from listening to DaCosta, I think we're going to be players in that top running back market. But I also think if we don't hit on those guys, because I think there's a number that they want to spend on running back, and if these guys don't come down to that number, that we're not going to do it, I think J.K. is going to be a backup plan. I do. And, and I didn't – that thought never crossed my mind until listening to the press conference today. I think J.K. may be the backup plan. I mean, you throw a guy like – like, and I didn't mention Swift. Swift may be in an option too as far as like a lower tier – not a lower tier, a lower – Price lower cost guy. So I think Swift's in there too, but J.K. might be a backup plan to those guys. And then drafting somebody, you know, maybe. But you got, like he said, you got to have more than two. And so I think maybe picking up one of those top-tier free agent guys, pairing them with Lamar Jackson. Um, hopefully Keith Mitchell will be back maybe week eight, somewhere around there, uh, and, and kind of bring his explosiveness back to, explosiveness back to the team. And, um, We'll go from there, man, but we'll see. We'll see. But Justice Hill, not Justice Hill, J.K. Dobbins may be in the mix, man, if we don't get one of those top-tier guys. And, again, I didn't think about that until hearing the Costa speak on it today. And, again, I'm trying to read between the lines on a lot of this stuff. So it's just me listening to him and trying to process what, he, what, what he's thinking. All right, also, the elephant in the room, Matt B.K. So uh, I think Tuesday is the deadline to tag – players. So um, he was asked about Matter BK and what they're trying to do and what trying to get done. So he mentioned that they are trying to get a long-term term deal done with, with uh, Justin Matter BK. I think cap-wise, the best option for the team is a long-term deal. But if they can't get a long-term deal done, which I hope they can, but if they can't, franchise tag. And we know the franchise tag, if I'm not mistaken, I don't have it right in front of me. It's $21 million, I think, if not 22 Correct me in the comment section. I mentioned it on a video or so earlier in the week. I just don't have the number in front of me. But that's a whole lot of darn money. Uh, so it's 21 or $22 million. So if we have to franchise tag him, 
that hurts us in getting other positions in free agency. That's why I'm hoping that we can find a long-term deal. Um, if not Tuesday, before Tuesday, because I think they got to July to find a, uh, to get a long-term deal, but I would really like it to be done before Tuesday. That way we can still be a player in this free agent market. But with all that being said, that just means my BK is not going anywhere. He's going to be a Raven, at least for one more year, at least for one more year. So, with that being said, Matt BK is going to be in the middle of that defense with Travis Jones, with uh, Broderick Washington, uh, with Roquan, with um, up the middle, who is that, Hamilton and Marcus Williams. So, the middle of that defense is locked in. Uh, go handle your business, groceries. You got to do what you got to do. Now, it's time to build up the offensive side. Time to build up that offensive line, which I did read before hitting the record button that they – the other guy mentioned the offensive line is a priority. And so um, hopefully we can rebuild the offensive line via draft. Or I really didn't see a lot of free agents in the offensive line group that I liked, but I have to go back and look again so I can kind of give you a better understanding if some guys out there that we should take a look at. But um, I just wanted to talk about the reaction to Eric DeCosta's press conference, and this is my two cents on it. And again, listen to that other guy just sounded like Charlie Brown's teacher. Womp, 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 womp. So I ain't, I had paid attention, and at some point I turned it off and said, forget this, I'd rather go do something else. So this is Coach Evans with uh, Sip the Tyler Films. If you like the video, like the video. If you have not subscribed, uh, hit the button, do that. Uh, hit the bell so you can be notified when these videos drop. And I appreciate y'all for hanging out with me on my lunch break, and I'll see y'all soon. Don't forget the video with Chris Just Joking coming up tonight. We're going to talk about some uh, top O-line picks and uh, see what he thinks about them, see what I think about them, and see if what we think about them matches up with what you think about them. And I'll see y'all next time. Peace.